Welcome to part C of the Farm Bill and Public Health Lecture. This is Ronnie Neff. So in the first two sections of the lecture, I described the history of the Farm Bill and the structure of the Farm Bill and how it's um, very much a public health bill. In this third section, I turn to the politics. What makes the Farm Bill what it is? What are some of the opportunities for improvement and for change? And more broadly, how can we be thinking about opportunities for advancing a more healthy and more sustainable food system using not only the Farm Bill, but other policies as well? So to get a handle on the politics of the Farm Bill, it's really valuable to start with the agriculture committees. The legislators on these committees um, traditionally are responsible for drafting the Farm Bill and play a major role in what gets in there and how it looks. That's a little different this time around, as I'll discuss. So the first thing that you might notice is the colors. You might see that the House is more Republican. You might see that the Democrats um, have a slight majority in the Senate. The second thing that you might notice is the districts where um, these committee members are coming from. These are generally the districts where there's a lot of commodity agriculture although there were a few key members from states such as Michigan, California, New York, where there is much more specialty crop agriculture, as well as areas where there's more interest in anti-hunger and other types of programs. So the second thing in terms of thinking about the power and politics of the Farm Bill is to, to look at who are the key stakeholders that have the greatest interest in making the Farm Bill look the way they want it to, and historically speaking, the Farm Bill was truly a farm bill, and so the major interests were agriculture and eventually agribusiness. Starting around the 1970s, the anti-hunger community um, became an active stakeholder in the Farm Bill as the food stamps, now SNAP, became part of the Farm Bill. And what that did is it brought urban legislators on board. And so um, you have urban legislators supporting commodity policy and you have the um, agriculture advocates supporting SNAP or, or food stamps and anti-hunger efforts. You put that pairing together. In some ways, you might look at that and wonder how closely their interests are aligned. But for this purpose, it's, it's been an extremely successful alliance. And there are ways in which their interests are aligned, in particular in terms of bringing down the cost of food. The question is the extent to which that food is health-promoting food that for which we brought the costs down. But nonetheless, so anti-hunger has been a major player in the Farm Bill. And then over time, other groups became active, such as sustainable agriculture, environment, international development has become an important player. More recently, community food security um, became involved. Again, this sort of tracks the history that I described in Part A. Public health is truly a newcomer to the Farm Bill. And people who work on Farm Bill policy often talk in terms of, you know, well, this is my X number of Farm Bills that I've been involved with. So public health, this is really, I'd say, our second Farm Bill. 2008 was, to my knowledge, the first time that public health as public health became involved, um, other than, as I mentioned earlier, anti-hunger could be said to be a public health group. But public health itself became involved in a small ad hoc coalition in 2008, which I was involved with. I was moderating the phone calls for that group. And then we've, we have been more active still in 2014. And here's a sort of brief overview of that engagement. I mentioned that ad hoc coalition that came together. We focused at that time on a set of priorities related to healthy and sustainably produced foods within the nutrition title. So we weren't taking on the huge scope of public health within the Farm Bill that I provided an overview of, we had some very specific priorities. The American Public Health Association also engaged in 2008, and um, the Farm Bill was one of their top three policy priorities, which um, many of us considered to be a big achievement to bring the association along. Um, and the, the identified priorities by, by um, that ad hoc coalition, coalition were all actually successful. So fast forward to 2014, and in the lead up to the 2014 Farm Bill, 
public health groups started organizing as far back as 2011. And there were meetings and there were discussions about how can we raise the priority of these issues in the Farm Bill. And a couple of groups came together. So a group came together called the Healthy Farms, Healthy People Coalition, where the real goal was to bring together um, public health and agriculture, both conventional and sustainable, and others who would identify shared interests and jointly push for these priorities. That group has continued to be active. We at the Center for a Livable Future are on the steering committee of that, um, particularly my colleague Becca Klein has been very active. There's a group called the GOAT Coalition that's essentially a broad progressive group and they brought together groups focused on a wide variety of issues. And then I've listed here some of the other groups that have come together. I want to note that cities in particular um, have been an interesting and relatively new player, um, recognizing that a lot of their interests are substantially represented in the Farm Bill. For example, I was mentioning um, the significant impact that SNAP dollars can have on a city, both in terms of its population um, and their ability to feed itself, but also in terms of the dollars that are coming in. And here, for example, is um, some Farm Bill principles that were set up by the city of Seattle. And you can see if you look at their six Farm Bill principles, they're actually reasonably well aligned with what we within public health would support. And there have been a number of other cities that have gotten engaged, including Baltimore. So as the Farm Bill develops, one of the things that happens is they put together marker bills, which are bills that put out a set of policy priorities and the hope is to later incorporate these into the Farm Bill. And I would highlight the Local Farms Food and Jobs Act, which um, came together over the past few years uh, because there were a number of priorities in here that are important to public health. And a number of these actually did make it into the final Farm Bill, so that was um, very positive. The Healthy Food Financing Initiative was also a um, marker bill and that also did make it into the Farm Bill, although the money is um, a little less clear. So let me give you some of the extremely messy history of how this Farm Bill came to be. And, and this is really an example of congressional gridlock at its absolute finest. The reason that I'm telling you this story is both because it's kind of astonishing and also because it explains partly how we got the farm bill that we did and why some people within public health are so very frustrated with working on a policy like the farm bill. So back in 2011, um, you may remember we were trying to reach a deficit reduction agreement. Um, a super committee was convened across Congress. As part of that, the House and the Senate Agriculture Committee leadership got together and they, submit, they submitted their own farm bill. Um, a secret farm bill, which they didn't share um, the development. There was no sort of um, transparency in that process. And they asked the super committee to include that. And that was kind of a big deal because um, traditionally, and, and even up until that point in time, farm bill development has been very, um, it's been an actively engaged process with a lot of stakeholders. So to do this behind closed doors was considered to be not very cool, but at least maybe they could get something through. Well, the super committee failed. We ended up with sequestration, and they cut about $7 billion from farm bill programs. So then in 2012, um, the Senate passed a farm bill, which cut $23 billion. $23 billion ends up kind of as a mantra over time. The House Agriculture Committee also passed a bill. It made much steeper cuts. Didn't make it to the floor. Partly this is because it was an election year, and the Republicans were demanding very steep cuts in SNAP and no Democrat was going to vote for that and nobody wanted to be seen anyway pushing a trillion dollar bill um, during an election year and so that basically nothing happened. So 2012 comes to an end and in October the Farm Bill actually expired. Now the Farm Bill had expired I believe only maybe one time before which was in the prior Farm Bill and it was very quickly dealt with. This time it was not so quickly dealt with. And you may remember from towards the beginning of Section A, I mentioned that when the Farm Bill expires, we revert to the 1949 and 1938 Farm Bills. That means that all these policies that made a lot of sense back in 1949 or 1938 would suddenly be the law of the land. 
And one of the particular concerns was how this would affect prices of something like dairy. Um, at the same time, when we, when we expired the Farm Bill, we also expired a number of programs that are in it, not all of them, and many of those were the newest and most progressive policy programs in the Farm Bill. But at the end of that year, the Senate and the House Agriculture Committee leadership, again, sort of behind closed doors, they agreed on an extension bill, and that was to take everybody through the end of September. But just in the nick of time, before anything could revert, the Senate and the House Agriculture Committee leadership agreed on an extension bill that would go through the end of September. But at the same time, the Senate Minority Leader and Vice President got together and developed their own Farm Bill extension. They stuck it on the fiscal cliff legislation, and it passed. So there was a lot of anger from the committee leadership for having for the fact that their bill was ignored, and that this was created without the input of those who would consider themselves to be the most engaged and expert and in contact with stakeholders about the Farm Bill. So no one was very happy with this. And so, but that was what it was, and we at least had an extension. So in May and June, the Senate passed the Farm Bill, the House Agriculture Committee passed a bill, and that bill failed on the House floor. So again, here we are, it's two years later, and we don't have a bill. And so, and the Senate version of the bill is cutting $4 billion from SNAP. House version is cutting $40 billion. This was a, a big point of contention between the two and will was throughout the process. So we needed something from the House, and finally in July the House comes together and they say, okay, we're going to pass two separate bills. We'll pass a farm bill and a nutrition bill, and we'll cut SNAP out of the farm bill. Well, this was very concerning to a lot of people because, as I mentioned, this coalition between agriculture and nutrition has been what's really been a major factor in enabling farm bills to pass over the years. So if you decouple those two, then um, both the farm programs and the nutrition programs become a lot more vulnerable. And at the same time, they wanted to basically take, get rid of that idea, make, make a new permanent farm bill so that it wasn't going to revert back to 1949. Now some, to some of us that make, might make a lot of sense initially. But the challenge with that is that um, having that threat of a 19 of reverting to 1949, 1938, has been a lot of the impetus for getting something done. And if we have some bill and we lose that pressure, that's a big risk. And so, um, again, this posed a huge problem. And blah blah blah, all the way up to October, farm bill expires again. At the same time, the entire government shuts down. It's a mess. So finally, fast forward early 2014, the House and Senate Agriculture Committee negotiators reached an agreement on a, a joint bill, which then passed the House and Senate. And February 7, 2014, President Obama signed the Farm Bill. As I've discussed in Part B, this is a farm bill that didn't really make anybody all that happy. It included major concessions all around and it's it's not optimal by any stretch and yet some people would say but we needed to have a farm bill because we had programs expired we didn't have disaster assistance for farmers that needed it and now at least we have a farm bill that's passed we're not going to keep on going into this expiration situation so when the farm bill passes we're not done and we can't go home the challenge is as I mentioned in the beginning that the Farm Bill um, writes some pieces into the legislation, and a lot of pieces have to be decided year by year by year in an appropriations process that allocates money, and in a rulemaking process that takes the little pieces of text that are in the Farm Bill and elaborates how those will be implemented. And if we're not engaged with that process, then those who do stay engaged get to have a say in what that will look like. So there's a need to stay vigilant. There's a need to start very early preparing for the next farm bill. So like I said, last time we were starting to prepare 2010-2011. You need both uh, continuous effort and, and organizing, especially with getting a new voice like public health in there. It takes a lot of effort and organizing to build that. And at the same time, if we really want to get new programs started in there, 
you need to have research and you need to have pilots. And often how things work in the farm bill is you get a little piece in there. You get a, a foot in the door with one farm bill. And then the next farm bill, maybe you're may able to get a little more money. And then maybe um, it becomes um, permanent or mandatory funding. And then maybe you get more money. And so it's, it's typically these farm bills are very incremental and gradual. And it all starts often with having some kind of pilot or research that can support the idea of of adding a piece of policy into the farm bill. The last reason why we need to stay engaged is if we really want to the farm bill to be part of our toolkit in shifting the food system in a positive and healthy direction, it really is going to take a long-term vision, both to see those changes that we want to make and see how we can chip away at them, and also to, to really think big and be prepared. So when a policy window opens up, when there's an opportunity to do something, we've got to be prepared to jump on it and, and move that forward when the time comes. There are a lot of people that are significantly frustrated with the prospect of investing the kind of energy that has been invested in making change in the farm bill. And at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities at the state and local level and even possibly in some other federal policies to make a difference. And I think advocates also need to be turning to those places. But we can't give up on the Farm Bill because we can't cede that territory and let others be driving that train completely. We need to continue to push the sorts of policies we want to defend the policies that, that are important to us as well as to push for uh, new initiatives. So what can you do? People listening to this lecture may have a wide variety of priorities about what they think is most important. So I'm not speaking about this in terms of telling you what you should think, but whatever you think about these issues, um, you can play a role in raising awareness, educating yourself and others about what's um, what these policy opportunities are. Work with Within your organizations, work with others to build coalitions. That's how we're going to get a lot of organizations together and strengthen our voice in these policy processes. Engage with food policy councils if they exist or work with others in your area to form them. The next bullet here I think is critically important. It affects the Farm Bill and it affects a huge variety of other policies as well. The way that our policies have played out, the way that our policy processes have played out is substantially shaped by the moneyed interests that are involved. So there's a real need to get in there and address campaign finance policy um, and to, to address the issues of transparency, like, for example, with the Farm Bill, these that got written both starting as far back as these, this um, group that, that was submitting a policy to the Super Committee all the way up to this House and Senate Joint Committee in early 2014, doing things behind closed doors in order to, you know, get it done. But what does that mean for the transparency and for the ability to weigh in after all the efforts that groups have made to um, build constituencies and to build movements to be locked out at key points? That's a real challenge. In addition, I highly recommend that you check out the Center for a Livable Futures policy page, which has a number of position papers and briefs and some reports and other materials that will help you learn more about these issues and also get a taste for some of the many ways that we have been weighing in to share evidence that can um, make a difference in policy processes. And that is linked from the Coursera main page for this session. So in conclusion, uh, the Farm Bill, it's a behemoth. It's dominated by politics, and that has shaped what that Farm Bill looks like. It's faced enormous budgetary challenges. It has tremendous effects on the entire food system and on the nation's health. There's a lot that we can do by organizing within the public health community and allies. We have made a lot of progress, um, especially given the size of and the, and the level of money within our operations devoted to um, to these kinds of issues. At the same time, given all the challenges with the Farm Bill, don't put all your eggs in that basket. Think broadly as well. 
This has been a really strange time over the past few years. In fact, we've never really had a situation like this um, as the Farm Bill has played out. And in fact, at the time of this recording, the Farm Bill has just finished playing out. So I've shared with you a lot of information, a lot of perspectives. I think that with a little more time, we're going to get even further insights into what happened and what what all this means. But regardless, I think the Farm Bill provides an opportunity to move the food system in a positive and healthy direction. And I encourage you all to just take the long-term view and think about what does our food system really need? What do you see as the biggest needs? And then think about well, what would it take to get there? What are the big picture policy opportunities? And what smaller pieces might help get us from here to there? It's been a real pleasure to speak with you and I want to emphasize that each and every one of you has a voice and you should use it.